Hello from the Channel Studio in London and welcome to another edition of Foreign Dispatches, the program that takes you around the world in 25 minutes. I'm Teniola Oyetayo. On the program this week, over a week after deadly floods, Libyans recount devastating loss in the city of Derna as death toll continues to rise. Plus, Sudan's health crisis deepens as UN raises alarm over impact on children amid ongoing conflict. Days after the flood that swept the center of the Libyan city of Derna into the sea, Families are still coping with the unbearable loss of loved ones and haunted by the unknown fates of those still missing. Amid the desperation, authorities say they haven't given up hope of finding survivors, but there are also fears about the spread of waterborne diseases putting vulnerable people at risk in the region. We are Zen, we look mad, we say hello to mother. Crying out the names of her family, in the Libyan city of Derna. Sabrine Bill digs through what's left of a collapsed building with her bare hands. Over a week after the flood that swept the center of the city into the sea, she's searching in vain to somehow reach her loved one's bodies from under the rubble of her brother's house. Oh God, even one body. Just let me find even one body. God have mercy on us. Who can we hold accountable? Who is responsible? What is the fault of the people and the souls who died? Why would a whole family die if we can pull out even one body to say we have buried them? We will be relieved and can mourn them. One week on, families are still coping with the unbearable losses of their dead. Sitting by his damaged house and covered in mud, 69-year-old Derna resident, Hassan Kassar, could not hold back his tears after losing four of his children to the floods. I found out that my son died and that the house collapsed on them. I did not expect that to happen from just a storm. I arrived here and people told me that that was what happened, that the water flooded the house while my children were inside. The uncles kept asking them to come out, but they could not. People are also haunted by the unknown fates of the missing, but many are still hopeful. I'm looking for my brother-in-law, his daughter and his wife. They left to that front yard, to the front yard here. There's no news about them. His sons who are abroad have been contacting me to check on their father. The rescuers, they, they told me they could not find anything here. No bodies, nothing. But I pray they will be alive and found. The center of Derna is a wasteland of muddy mounds where buildings once stood. Dams above the city burst in the storm, sending a huge torrent down a seasonal riverbed that runs through the center of the city of 120,000 people. More than 30,000 people are now homeless. As you can see from the surroundings behind me, the situation is horrific. I cannot explain what I saw on the way coming to Derna. I saw roads, Split in half, I saw massive rocks that have been moved over from neighboring mountains to the coastal areas. Homes have been demolished, damaged, submerged underwater. Families have lost a very big number of their loved ones. Many are still missing. Some have been split and others have been displaced. The search and rescue teams continue to try to save lives, but the situation is far from being stable at the moment. UNHCR has already provided core relief items as a first and immediate response and we're working with our local partners to provide a lot more to try to mitigate the impact on those families who continue to suffer tremendous amount of shock. But the needs are huge and a lot more support is needed and urgent. Thousands are dead and thousands more missing. Both Libyan authorities and foreign nations have collaborated to aid the affected, but progress has been slow. 
bridges, roads and other infrastructures have been severely damaged, isolating the city. Electricity has been cut off and the first relief convoys only reached the area late on Tuesday. Are, are changing as we speak. I mean, uh, the numbers are thousands. I mean, so far as we got confirmed, bodies uh, reached 6,000. But the missing, because the area that was hit had a population of 30,000 in terms of that area where it's direct hit. The whole city could be more than 100,000 plus uh, citizens, you know, there. But the direct hit came to an area where it's around 30,000. And as we speak now, many of those are either uh, being in a rescue effort or missing because they were uh, hit badly uh, and when that happened. <laughs> On Monday, angry and tearful protesters rallied against the government. They say the threat to the city from the crumbling dams above it had been widely known. They also blame authorities for failing to evacuate people on time. The World Meteorological Organization has said the huge loss of life could have been avoided if Libya, a failed state for more than a decade, had a functioning weather agency in place. Meanwhile, attention has also turned to sanitation and safety. Workers were seen sanitizing the streets on Monday as part of a campaign organized by the Libyan government to avoid the spread of diseases. Officials say the biggest threat to survivors may now come from contaminated water supplies. Communicable diseases can start from the survivors if they don't have access to safe water if they don't have access to safe food, we might start to see some cases of foodborne and waterborne diseases. The sea continues to wash up more bodies every day as a death toll and the number of missing persons rise. Calls from within Derna and other areas for more vehicles, equipment, rescue teams and services to aid in the search for the missing are growing louder. The extensive destruction of the city highlights the fragility of Libya's situation, a country rich in oil but divided between two competing administrations, each backed by armed militias for nearly a decade. The full scale of the death toll is yet to emerge, with thousands of people still missing. Officials have given widely varying death tolls. For now, People wait anxiously in the rubble-filled streets for any good news they can cling to. And from Libya, we head over to Sudan, where civilians have been caught in the crossfire of fighting between the country's armed forces and paramilitary group Rapid Support Forces for nearly six months now. The war since April has devastated the country's healthcare system, worsening hunger, destroying infrastructure, as well as killing and displacing thousands of civilians, especially children. This is one of the few medical facilities still operating in the Sudanese city of Omdurman as health services continue to collapse in the country. Civilians trapped here amid the raging war between the Rapid Support Forces RSF, and the Sudanese army are struggling to access medical care. With a severe shortage of necessary medications, especially for the people with chronic diseases, some patients have suffered complications, such as amputations, according to health officials at the hospital. The most critical issue we're facing is the shortage of medications, especially for those with chronic diseases like hypertension and diabetes. Because of the war, the medications are not available, and so the complications begin to show we also have another problem with the laboratory and minor surgeries, with the shortage of medical solutions and medications. These are the main issues. Nearly six months into the conflict, the country's healthcare sector is on its knees due to direct attacks from the warring parties as well as shortages of staff and medicines. I'm not the only one suffering. Everyone is suffering with the medication and meeting with doctors. The center is crowded. 
I've been here since 9 a.m. and I've just seen the doctor now. The center is crowded and to find the medication, you need to search outside the center. Residents in the city, Omdomen, are also struggling to make ends meet, with many unable to afford a little as a loaf of bread. We have not received our salaries for four or five months, which created an abundance in food products of all sorts, including wheat, as well as other products. But the real problem is that people are not able to buy because simply they don't have money. Sudan has the highest number of internally displaced people globally, according to a recent report from the international NGO Save the Children. At least 7.1 million people, including an estimated 3.3 million children, are now displaced from their homes across the country. More than double the 3.2 million IDPs prior to the conflict that erupted mid-April. Diseases including cholera, malaria and fevers, as well as malnutrition, are threatening millions of children. The United Nations said this week that more than 1,200 children have died in refugee camps since May, with thousands more at risk. More than 1,200 refugee children under five have died in nine camps in the period between 15th May and 14th uh, September. This is due to a combination of a suspected measles outbreak and uh, high malnutrition. Over 3,000 suspected cases of uh, measles have been reported in this same period. And also we've seen more than 500 suspected uh, cases of cholera uh, in other parts of the country. This is combined in a situation where we also seen dengue, malaria, in a context that uh, is as increased epidemic risk and challenges for epidemic control. And uh, unfortunately, we fear that the numbers will continue uh, rising because of uh, strained resources. As, as partners have mentioned, um, WHO and UNICEF, we continue having challenges, logistical and other challenges, to ensure supplies are adequately provided, to ensure the vaccines are adequately provided to all the targeted uh, refugees, trying to expand the target age group for vaccination. To nutrition, those services are equally devastated. Every month, 55,000 55, children require treatment for the most lethal form of malnutrition. Uh, and yet in Khartoum, one in 50 nutrition centres is functional. In West Darfur, it's one in 10. Now, the most recent official casualty figures for children killed in this conflict by fighting are 435. Given the utter devastation that you've heard to those life-saving services, UNICEF fears Sudan's youngest citizens are entering a period of unprecedented mortality. Pass the, floor to Mr. the United Nations also says ethnically motivated you, attacks President. have killed hundreds European in Sudan's Union. West Darfur region. And in West Darfur, ethnically motivated attacks perpetrated by the RSF and allied Arab militias have resulted in the deaths of hundreds of so-called non-Arab civilians, primarily from Masalit communities. This has mainly occurred in the capital, El Janina, but also in at least eight other locations. The RSF now controls all but two localities in West Darfur. Such developments echo a horrific past that must not be repeated. We also see worrying signs of involvement in the conflict of militia, often affiliated along tribal or ethnic lines. Mobilization campaigns by the SAF pose a real risk of sparking intercommunal tension and triggering even further conflict between communities. More than 1.8 million people are expected to flee from Sudan to five neighboring countries by the end of the year. Tensions between the army and RSF, which jointly staged a coup in 2021, erupted into fighting over a plan to integrate their forces as part of a transition to civilian rule. While several countries have launched mediation efforts, none have succeeded in bringing a halt to the fighting. When foreign dispatches returns, world leaders address pressing global issues at the 78th session of the UN General Assembly in New York. More on that in just a moment.
please stay with us. Thanks for staying with us on the program. Amid numerous international issues, from the war in Ukraine to climate change and military takeovers in Africa, world leaders and high-ranking diplomats gathered in New York for the 78th session of the United Nations General Assembly this week. The general debate, one of the UN's most anticipated annual events, offers a platform for leaders to lay out their priorities for the coming year and urge cooperation on pressing issues through through 15-minute speeches. Let's take a look at the highlights. The 78th session of the UN General Assembly brought together more than 140 world leaders Our to world discuss pressing global issues. issues. The meeting opened with a warning from the UN Secretary General Antonio global Guterres that the world is becoming unhinged as geopolitical tensions rise. Global challenges are mounting and we seem incapable of coming together to respond. We confront a host of existential threats, from the climate crisis to disruptive technologies, and we do so at a time of chaotic transition. We are inching ever closer to a great fracture in economic and financial systems and trade relations, one that threatens a single open internet with diverging strategies on technology and artificial intelligence and potentially clashing security frameworks. Reflecting on a year in which the United Nations has seemed paralyzed visions over the war in Ukraine, the UN I chief no called illusions. for financial reform, Reforms climate solidarity and an end to coal. In the face of all these challenges and more, compromise has become a dirty word. Our world needs statesmanship, not gamesmanship and gridlock. As I told in the G20, it is time for a global compromise. Politics is compromise. Diplomacy is compromise. Effective leadership is compromise. Exhibit A, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The war, in violation of the United Nations Charter and international law, has unleashed an exodus of horror. Lives destroyed, human rights abused, families torn apart, children traumatized, hopes and dreams sheltered, shattered. But beyond Ukraine, the war has serious implications for us all. Nuclear threats put us all at risk. Ignoring global treaties and conventions makes us all less safe. And the poisoning of global diplomacy obstructs progress across the board. For most Western leaders, as well as the climate crisis, the war in Ukraine was a key focus. In his address, the U.S. President Joe Biden appealed to world leaders to stand with Ukraine against Russia. For the second year in a row, this gathering, dedicated to peaceful resolution of conflicts, is darkened by the shadow of war. An illegal war of conquest brought without provocation by Russia against its neighbor Ukraine. Like every nation in the world, the United States wants this war to end. No nation wants this war to end more than Ukraine. And we strongly support Ukraine in its efforts to bring about a diplomatic resolution that delivers just and lasting peace. But Russia alone, Russia alone bears responsibility for this war. Russia alone has the power to end this war immediately. And it's Russia alone that stands in the way of peace because the Russia's price for peace is Ukraine's capitulation, Ukraine's territory, and Ukraine's children. Russia believes that the world will grow weary and allow it to brutalize Ukraine without consequence. But I ask you this, if we abandon the core principles of the United States to appease an aggressor, can any member state in this body feel confident that they are protected? If we allow Ukraine to be carved up, is the independence of any nation secure? I'd respectfully suggest the answer is no. We have to stand up to this naked aggression today and deter other would-be aggressors tomorrow. The, General Assembly the Ukrainian the president Ukrainian also took the stage calling for global solidarity while accusing Russia of manipulating global food markets and of kidnapping Ukrainian children. While Russia is pushing the world to the final war, Ukraine is doing everything to ensure that after Russian aggression, no one in the world will dare to attack any nation. Weaponization must be restrained. 
war crimes must be punished. Deported people must come back home and the occupier must return to their own land. We must be united to make it and we'll do it. Slava Ukraini! As is usual, the Russian President Vladimir Putin and the Chinese President Xi Jinping were not in attendance and were instead represented by ministers. Meanwhile, the state of democracy in Africa was also a point of concern at the UNGA following recent coups in Niger and Gabon. In his first address at the UN General Assembly, Nigerian President Bola Tinubu condemned the spate of military takeovers on the continent. Military coups are wrong, as in any titled civilian political arrangement that is, we perpetuate injustice. The wave crossing part of Africa does not demonstrate favor for towards coup. It is a demand for solution to perennial problem. Let us dig it deeper. Regarding Niger, we are negotiating with the military leaders as chairman of ECOWAS. I seek to help establish democratic governance in a manner that addresses the political economy challenges confronting that nation, including violent extremists who seek to foment instability in our region. I send a hand of friendship to all of you who may genuinely support this mission for a democratic governance in that nation. The president, who is the chairman of the West African bloc ECOWAS, also touched on the need for Africa to scale the limitations of foreign exploitation to reach its lofty potential the importance of the international community seeing African development as a priority for investments and the need to tackle the effects of climate change. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa, also focusing on the state of democracy in Africa, called for the global community to support the African Union's efforts against unconstitutional changes on the continent. He also spoke of climate change, denounced the billions of dollars spent on war instead of development and highlighted the importance of empowering women. As a global community, we should be concerned by the recent incidents of unconstitutional changes of government in some parts of Africa. The global community needs to work alongside the African Union to support peace efforts in the DRC, in Libya, Sudan, Somalia, Mali, Central African Republic, South Sudan, North Mozambique, the Great Lakes region, the Sahel, Niger, and the Horn of Africa. Africa is least responsible for the climate damage that has been caused, and yet it bears the greatest burden. Centuries after the end of the slave trade, decades after the end of the colonial exploitation of Africa's resources, the people of our continent are once again bearing the cost of industrialization of the North and the development of the wealthy nations of the world. The wealth of Africa belongs to Africans. It is a grave indictment on this international community that we can spend so much money on war, and in fact trillions are being spent on war, but we cannot support action that needs to be taken to meet the basic needs of billions of people in the world. Needs such as addressing hunger, health, empowering women, and making sure that there is development in countries that are vulnerable. Meanwhile, as world leaders delivered their address, usual protests were held outside the United Nations headquarters. Opponents of the Iranian government gathered to express their dismay over President Ebrahim Raisi's presence at the annual gathering. 
Protests also took to the streets over a range of issues, including climate change, ongoing tensions between Azerbaijan and Armenia, and the war in Ukraine. And that's the program today. But remember, our top stories are never far away. You can catch them on ChannelsTV.com. Thank you for watching. I'm Tenyola Oyetayo. Bye for now.